Um, so we're going to hand over to um, Max and Mark, and they're going to be talking about Project Awesome. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. I am Max, and this is Mark, and we're here to talk about a little something we call Project Awesome. And we're going to tell you about our inspiration for the project, what it is, and how it works. Um, <laughs> um, Mark had loads of church organ bits and we had a shared interest in making quirky contraptions and I wanted to make use of some of the enormous amount of junk that I had lying around the place where I live. Our plan was to make something that would enable us to get into festivals without paying. <laughs> Our first concept was a giant phallic sculpture made of spanners spurting flames, which we still might build at some point. but we decided to go with something of a slightly broader appeal. Um, but before I get into that, first a little bit about us. Uh, right, I'm, ooh, hello. I'm Mark, um, always been into radio and electronics and stuff really, and uh, fortunately for this project, I did work for a while as an organ builder uh, when I left school on actual pipe organs. Um, but then I trained as an English teacher, ended up working back in technology again, which is where I've stayed really, and I've worked on everything from being a corporate sound engineer, um, to designing military intercoms. Um, I started out my working life as a mortgage advisor, and that didn't really work out for me, so I became a beer smuggler, I ran a sound system, um, I joined the circus for a while, and I eventually ended up as a blacksmith. So as for the organ parts, um, when I was a teenager, uh, growing up in Bristol, uh, I got given a medium-sized church organ from a church that was modernizing and as a teenager I thought it would be a really cool thing to own um, and you know my parents had a big garage and so it went into storage for nearly 30 years. I thought it might be fun to do something with this organ that Mark had and we document our journey of trying to make the thing work and share it on YouTube. So eventually uh, our first thing that we wanted to do is to make a trolley, some, something like we could push around, like a, a mobile exhibit that we could, we could take around festivals. Um, then I said to Mark, let's think a bit bigger and we'll mount it on one of my trailers. And then after a few beers one night, I said to Mark, let's put it on the Zill. I was gonna go into a long explanation about what Zills are, um, and it turns out there's one around the corner. So if you wanna know what a Zill is, there's one behind us. But you'll see up on the screen now that these are Zills. Um, they're military trucks from the peak of the Soviet Union. They're lovely vehicles. Uh, they've got six wheel drive, central tire inflation, and a huge V8 petrol engine, which is really thirsty, unreliable, and in my case, completely lacking a starter motor. So uh, this uh, video from day one gives a bit more history of Max's Zill. If we can have some sound on it, that'd be cool. Soviet Union. It's, um, it's a fascinating bit of Cold War history in itself. Um, unfortunately, I've left it neglected for some time. Let's have a look. Here she is. This is a Zill 131. It's, uh, although you can't tell at the moment, a six wheel drive uh, troop carrier, well, general purpose vehicle from the Soviet Union. And this particular one was made in 1975, which makes it as old as I am. So that's how it was. It was it was sat in a hedge. It had been there about 10 years because the thing is, once you buy a Zill, there's not an awful lot you can do with it. Um, so I didn't in the end. So this was my big chance to get it running. Um, it had been there for a long time, it hadn't started for a long time. The, the starter motor hadn't been, I think it was about 15 years since the starter motor fell to bits. And yeah, the hedge had kind of incorporated itself very much into the truck. Mark was quite dubious that we could even get the thing running, let alone leave the hedge. I, I think it was fair that I was dubious to a degree because it was stuck in a hedge. And in reverse, yeah, with a seized yeah, clutch, in reverse. <laughs> with flat tyres, it hadn't been started for years, uh, didn't even have a starter motor, it didn't have a working fuel system. That's true, yeah, no fuel um, pump. So, oh, anyway, we'll take a look at stay, the next stage, I think. 
So I set about um, just trying to find the starting handle, really, to begin with. You're not, don't worry, you're not going to watch the whole thing of me mowing the hedge. But there's the starting handle. So out into the daylight for the first time in many years. Then, um, what did we do next? Uh, no, we didn't. We opened up the bell housing, um, rammed a crowbar into the clutch and popped it off so that then we could start the thing without it just going backwards into the neighbouring field and upsetting my farmer friend. Here we go, the first attempt. You're only seeing the highlights. And there we go. <laughs> that was a whole can of Stella, well, petrol in a Stella can, down the carburetor to make that happen. So, we started it. That was a whole can of fuel gone. We haven't quite pumped up the tyres yet. <laughs> Five litres of fuel to pump up the tyres. Almost pumped up the tyres. Uh, so it really seems so unlikely. The idea of hand cranking a six litre V8 engine while pouring petrol straight down the carburetor was weird enough. Having the thing actually fire up and run for a while was quite unexpected. So things were looking up, really. This was our second attempt at starting it. This was actually Mark's, Mark's birthday last year. It was almost this time last year, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and here's our first ever drive as Project Awesome. Straight into a wall. Um, that was episode one of our YouTube adventure, which has done quite well. It's just gone over a million views now, and um, although most of those seem to be in Indonesia for some reason, it's gone down a tree in, in the Far East. So then, it, again, you're only seeing the highlights, but a few more attempts and uh, quite a few more cans of fuel. Uh, we managed to get it up the hill towards my workshop. The entire journey took about four months. It's not something you want to crank every day. I like this bit. Yeah, I nearly lost the dog at that bit, didn't we? Twice. <laughs> so now we had a platform to put our project onto, but it was obvious, well, even before we'd attempted to start the thing, that that engine had to go. Now, it turns out it's just as cost-effective to buy an entire lorry as it is to buy an engine and gearbox. So, so I did. This is a um, ex-British Telecom vehicle. They were, we're quite happy. We've made it back without being arrested and with a slipping clutch. It was quite a triumphant moment, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that clutch really did smell. So we've got the engine and gearbox, which is the primary reason for buying a DAF. It also um, gave us a box which we could put the organ in that we're going to build. But on the DAF, it's much too big. Um, it would overhang the zill hugely. So the first thing to do was to mow a meter off of the box to make it more proportionally correct for what we wanted. So what have we got going on here? Oh, this is really... Yeah, circular saw. We had Mark on hand with a camera in case things got exciting. I, I was hoping they would actually, in secretly. It, it was quite a worrying moment when it went right through. I thought the whole thing was just going to fall off. <laughs> So that's removing the, the extra meter from the walls. Um, then the next bit, which I ended up doing on my own uh, a few days later, I had to take that front piece and then stick it back on to make the, the new box. This turned out to be quite awkward on my own. Bet it was easy to drop it. Yeah, it's quite easy. There, there we go. 
And you'll notice that when I get it back up, I then ram it into the roof a few times and give myself some more work to do, uh, repairing fiberglass later on. But eventually I got there, and as I was saying to Mark earlier, I didn't lose my temper and throw the thing into the hedge, which was great. It would have, would have certainly been easier with two, I think, or yeah, three, yeah. and a crane. Yeah. Here we go. Come on. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, well, it was jammed at the bottom. Here we go. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now we've got a four meter long box, which is just right to go on the zill. And the next stage is to fill it with organ. Oh, probably most of you are familiar with a church organ, which is something where you see all the pipes. The donor for the first part of our project was a church organ, um, and we're going to incorporate that into the project, but we're also going to add a lot more of theatre organ parts. Uh, theatre organs are something you don't see very much because they tend to be part of a whole building. More familiar, I guess, would be uh, fairground organs. Now, we've all seen these, and they tend to make a dreadful noise. Um, there's, what, uh, well, they do. There are, I mean, everyone who goes to steam fairs has had to endure these things, and they're a really loud, offensive box of whistles, which is nice, because we want to be able to do loud and offensive. But the big problem with fairground organs is that they're not fully chromatic, um, so you can't play all the notes. And also, they tend to have a limited um, uh, capability of the kind of sounds they can produce. So, although they have high-pressure pipework, which makes them loud, um, they wouldn't quite be able to cover the, the range of um, uh, sounds that we'd want to do. Also, the important thing about this instrument we're building is that we wanted it to be not just playable via uh, MIDI from a, a computer, but we want to be able to have someone actually come along and play the thing. So we kind of look towards, uh, more towards the cinema organ part. And uh, the, the thing with the cinema organs, they were designed more to be a kind of one-man orchestra and also had the sort of sound capability to fill massive auditoriums with, with So sound. I'll just interject at this point that everyone thinks of, if you are familiar with a cinema organ at all, which probably most of the people here under the age of 80 are not, it's something that you imagine, you associate with like Blackpool um, ballroom and that kind of hideous music. But it, it wasn't always that way. They were initially designed to accompany silent films and the cinema organ was designed to replace an entire orchestra and so you could have one guy making all the sounds of an orchestra and what we're going to try and do is bring that back so that instead of just having a fairground organ playing fairground music or a church organ playing church music or a, a Wurlitzer playing ballroom music we want to be able to do everything from really nice church music to really offensive drum and bass. Um, obviously that would require a few things, um, particularly the ability to control it by MIDI and the people who designed the, um, uh, even the electro-pneumatic uh, uh, pipe organs like the Wurlitzers, the theatre organs back in say the 1920s um, weren't really considering MIDI any more than they were considering nose bleeding drum and bass. So. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you have in-depth knowledge of the way that uh, 1920s pipe organs worked. Um, you're going to leave here with a bit more knowledge than you probably arrived with. Um, so we've got a, a little diagram here. These are actually, this is a four-stage process. Um, uh, the blue sections on there, do they look blue on that screen? Oh, that's good. That's excellent. Um, the blue parts, um, uh, a wind under pressure inside a, a box, and that's what we call a wind chest. I'll just say, Mark, because yeah, it's yeah. not really clear on here, this relates to one tiny part of one wind chest. So each rank of pipes has a wind chest, and that wind chest is full of what you see here on this picture, and it has to go through this entire process just to play one note. So e each pipe on the organ um, would, it has to have one of these um, units on. The, the blue section, as I said, was wind under pressure, and probably not the sort of air pressure that a lot of you are used to. I'm not talking about 150 PSI, the outputs from an a, a air compressor. If you tried running a pipe organ on that kind of pressure, all you're going to achieve is launching the pipes up through the ceiling. Um, that could... <laughs> um, ooh. It's a one-off show then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, They're expensive yes. pipes. Would, of finale. Yeah, well. um, <laughs> 
But just as a basic, anyway, I mean, these instruments really did represent some of the earliest and most innovative uses of, of electro um, pneumatic, sort of electro mechanical systems. You've ha you have a magnet in the bottom of the, uh, 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 the chest that, when it's actuated, opens a tiny, um, tiny valve. And just, just, it's almost a fraction of a millimeter, unbelievably small. That exhausts a little leather pouch, um, which in the second bit of the diagram, uh, you'll see the, the, the blue bit goes white. It's exhausted that little pouch, opening a secondary valve that's just a little bit bigger, a secondary stage, which then collapses a bigger pneumatic motor, which again is all wood and leather. This was uh, what they've been made of for centuries. Um, opening the, what they call the pallet valve under the pipe and allowing the pipe to sound. And although that sounds like quite a complex process, after you've energized that magnet and they're sort of designed this way, that all happens in a fraction of a second. Because when you play an instrument, you need that note to sound straight away. If there's a long delay, it makes it very, very unpleasant to play, um, sort of, if not impossible. So we had all the theory, and I, I had worked on a few electro-pneumatic systems before on organs when I, when I worked in the industry, though not much. So we thought the only real way to get set about this was to build a prototype with a couple of little wind chests. And so we had lots of pipes, lots of components, but we didn't have any wind chest, did we really? So no, we, we, had, to we had nothing on. to sit the pipes into to make all this process happen. So that's what we had to do next, was to actually build a wind chest and then try and sit the pipes on it and try and get some music out of the thing. So I scribbled a design on the back of a fag packet, gave Max a big chunk of plywood and off he went. Yeah, so what you see here is a sheet of plywood that I drilled lots of holes in and then cut channels. So at the top of the bit of wood there, you'll see all the electromagnets, um, and then we've got channels going through the wood, and this is upside down effectively, so if this was the other way up and encased in a box, you'd put the pipes on top of it. Um, that was pretty much it. I, these parts were all robbed from some random uh, scrap bits of pipe organ that um, I'd had lying around, so we were able to salvage enough to just build this prototype you know, just in the kitchen. Um, but obviously <laughs> power's nothing without control, and we had to drive this thing, and we wanted it to be MIDI controllable. So uh, I had to build a hastily thrown together control system uh, on Vero board, just made up out of Darlington drivers and shift registers. Um, and Oh God, we're running out of time. I'm going to speed this up. Um, so building stuff of that scale on Vero board is a little bit tedious. It was a couple of nights of this kind of thing. But I think there's, as there's a lot of computer programming type people around it, I'm going to quickly try and explain how the MIDI software works. Um, we've got an Arduino, which receives MIDI data via its serial port, and uh, that's, uh, those note-on-and-note-off messages on each of the, uh, uh, the notes is uh, added or subtracted from 128-bit integer, uh, depending on the note-on-and-note-off messages. All those bits are shifted from the, uh, uh, that, of that integer, passed through an I.O. pin to an array of 8-bit shift registers. The output of the shift registers are connected to some Darlington arrays, which drive the magnets. It's a really relatively simple process. Weirdly, it works quite reliably. Um, building it on the Vero board took ages, um, so I think the net for the bigger system, it's going to get a PCB designed for it. Yeah, quite a few. <laughs> so like everything we do with this organ, the individual part is quite easy to work out, but then you've got to do it by 100 or 200 or 300 times to actually get semblance of a tune out of the thing. So we've got, I think, somewhere like 56 pipes here we've managed to just chuck onto a couple of um, experimental wind chests and we'd rigged it up to the control. And I mean, what better thing to play uh, for the first thing on a homemade pipe organ than uh, Bach's Staccato and Fugue in D minor. stage is all breadboard and very board and crocodile clips. So this is completely unregulated air as well. What we haven't told you is about the entire air regulation system that we need to build to control this thing properly. You saw it there running off of a bouncy castle blower and a pair of vacuum cleaner hoses. 
Um, so, right, well, it's all looking good. We've got an organ that works. I learned how to tune them when I was a kid, so that wasn't too bad. Um, all we need to do, really, now is scale it all up. And, and we, um, need to, we needed to make it awesome. That was <laughs> awesomer. Awesome, awesomer. Awesomer, yes. yes awesomer. So um, the, put a bigger scale means controlling significantly more pipes. We've got 56 pipes there. Um, we needed to up, up, upscale it from a few dozen pipes to a few hundred pipes. So Mark was off sailing a yacht, and I was keeping an R on eBay, and I happened to come across a, an entire well, four-rank wind chest that was going for next to nothing. Um, at the other end of the country. So I rebuilt my trailer and we set off to Bradford, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, three days it took to get it. <laughs> the first part of the journey was made in my 1967 Land Rover towing the trailer up to Marks, then we relayed another up to Brad. Well, anyway, it was an epic journey. But we, so what you see here is the wind chest upside down and you can probably just about make out all the little, tiny little magnets on top. So this is going to massively increase our capability of noise making. Um, the problem is it had been kept in a damp shed uh, for a decade, and though uh, the homemade trailer made it up about there perfectly, really, we had to get it back to the workshop, get it apart, and see what was going on. And in actual fact, this was um, uh, there was a bit of water damage in there. There's an awful lot of leather uh, bits and pieces. Ev effectively, every one of its 244 pallet valves 488 pneumatic motors, 244 springs and magnets, all had to be checked, removed, cleaned, where necessary, replaced. Um, it took a week, which is what this time lapse is of. Um, we wouldn't make you sit through it in real time. It was incredibly tedious and fiddly. But a, a, a lovely piece of kit that we managed to get our hands on. The build quality is fantastic of this thing. It's just, it's full of rich mahogany. Um, so we also uh, took the opportunity to split it into two, actually. So we've got two 128-note uh, uh, wind chests to stick in the truck, it'll just make it easier to mount. And I'm going to have to move this on a bit because we're running out of time. So um, the, that's the state we're currently at with the organ build. The wind chest was done, what, a couple of weeks ago? Um, so now we've got capacity for an extra 244 pipes, which is more pipes than we've got. So we're in the process now of either acquiring more theatre organ pipe work, which is very difficult, or we're going to be faced with actually building that as well, which we've not ruled out. Um, this is this was the last iteration of the solenoid driver I was thinking of making. We want to make it modular and scalable, because if we want to add to it at any point, we want to be able to just fill another trailer with crap and plug it in. So um, this is a, an eight-channel output board. Um, we're going to uh, definitely go to PCB, because doing anything more than prototypes on Vero board is a bit odd. Um, Right, minutes left. Right, uh, so that's the organ side of the project, um, but it was never going to be just about the organ. We wanted to put some other toys on it that we could play music on. That we could, um, you know, the Zill's a ridiculous truck in itself. We want to make a ridiculous show to put on it. So we thought it'd be rather fun to try building a musical Tesla coil. Um, now it seemed to make sense to start small with these things because neither of us had built Tesla coils before. Uh, and I managed to wind a convincing enough coil that was similar to others I'd, I'd found online. And um, uh, I built dr a driver board out of a load of salvage bits from some of Max's old mains inverters. I don't know how many of you have ever seen his channel, but he lives off grid and makes videos about it and stuff. So as a result, he's got a pile of blown um, mains inverters and battery chargers, which is ripe for picking IGBTs and MOSFETs and all kinds of useful power electrics from. So. Um, it was mainly built with salvage bits, um, and it ended up being driven from a 300 volt DC uh, power supply. Uh, we use an Arduino to receive MIDI signals. Uh, we interrupted the coil's 200 or so kilohertz um, uh, uh, frequency, hit the appropriate audio frequencies, and uh, actually it worked. Um, so yeah, I think it, this it is. It kind of worked. Well, this is it playing the Russian national anthem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, the driver wasn't quite capable of the power necessary to get proper arcs. Um, even so, the sound levels of this power were already very loud. Uh, the full power version should make a, a good solo instrument to accompany the organ, um, I think. Uh, but it's been a really steep learning curve, and if no one's tried building a solid state Tesla coil, I guarantee hilarity. Your broadband router keeps rebooting, lights in the house flash on and off, with very little other. Um, you're constantly replacing starters in fluorescent tubes. Um, it's been brilliant. And I've got this massive bag of blown semiconductors. 
I've, um, you know, flywheel diodes, I, IGBTs. Um, it's quite good. I think this is a video of um, my voltage doubler going pop. Um, oh. This is a daily event. It, it's what absolutely amazing. Um, so I mean, really good at blowing up components. So the problem is with the coils that we want to put on the truck, these are the sort of transistors that we need to be using. And that you're into a different league of, of hedonism there because these things are a couple of hundred quid each if you've got to buy them. Um, they should be capable of switching 1200 volts at about 60 amps. Um, so blowing these is going to be expensive. So we thought perfect blowing smaller transistors and then move on to, to blowing like big ones. These ones incidentally were salvaged from a scrap electric train. Um, anyway, moving on, we've, uh, that's where we're up to with the main core of the project, really, so what's next? Um, I think next is to get the engine in the Zill and make it back into a truck um, and get a box which is still on the remains of the DAF, and the DAF is about, you know, it's still half with us, um, get that box onto the Zill and then start building the organ in it. It's, it's an awful lot of work to do. We were, yeah, <laughs> we, we were thinking of driving it here, but yeah, it hasn't got an engine, so we didn't. Um, we've got a few um, people involved with side projects as well. A um, friend of ours is building a laser harp, which he intends to plug into it and use as a MIDI controller to play the organ via his harp. Did I get that right? I, I think he wants to put on a ball gown and do some laser harp show controlling the Tesla coils, I think. <laughs> yeah. Why not? It seems very keen. Um, and you've been playing that in your kitchen for the well, time. Well, yeah, being. I mean, the, to be honest, machine. I have been prototyping the laser systems with him. I mean, this is uh, sort of cheap laser galvos and stuff um, ordered from uh, China for me, but they're actually really rather fun. But so far, we've uh, just really used it as an excuse to put the smoke machine on in the kitchen on a night and um, just <laughs> play around. You know, there's plans for other various uh, audiovisual effects, um, probably involving propane, because me and Max are both quite into fire and explosions and no post-apocalyptic Soviet truck mounted lightning spewing pipe organ would be complete without the addition of some fire. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so anyway, that's where we're at. Um, uh, we're just about on our time limit as well. So. Yeah, so thank you all for turning up and listening to us ramble on about our completely daft project. If anybody's interested in watching further progress, um, I've been told to give you a call to action and watch my videos. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. We've got time for a few questions. Let's see some hands. One at the back. Right. You mentioned the um, the airflow and the the pressure. You, we wouldn't be talking normal, you know, high pressure stuff. What kind of pressure and airflow are you using to? to make these noises? Uh, okay, in organ building, pressure is measured in inches of wind, and uh, church organ pipes start from about three inches of wind, and um, theatre organ pipes typically around 10 to 15, and that is just um, how far that wind pressure can lift water in a tube. So if you blow into a tube, and you lift that water three inches, that's three inches of wind pressure, so tiny pressures. Hi. Um, your proper theatre organ sound is a really big tremulant. Are you going to have a big tremulant? Please tell me you are. <laughs> um, the wind chest, I'm so glad somebody here knows something. Yes, um, no versatile instrument like that would be complete without a tremulant. A tremulant is something that um, sits there, it's a bellows that wobbles up and down and wobbles the pressure of the wind supply up and down slightly and gives a, a tremulant, a vibrato to the sound and every rank will have its own individual tremulant just like you'd find on a big Wurlitzer. Uh, talk to us about percussion. <laughs> we left out the percussion bit because we had to suddenly catch up and we're running behind. Um, Percussion-wise, we're aiming for some uh, tuned percussion in a typical sort of Wurlitzer-y way, so the usual marimbas, um, xylophones, that kind of thing. Um, they'll all be pneumatically driven, but because we want to do drum and bass, um, having traditionally driven percussion like you'd find on a theatre organ, they're always a little bit lame. We've yet to come up with a system, but I suspect it'll either involve proper high-pressure wind or um, massive solenoids. Any more questions? Um, if there's any more questions, we're going to be in the bar for the next couple of hours drinking lots of beer, so feel free to come and buy us beer and talk to us. Can I, just a quick question. Um, can we have an update in two years' time? Ah. 
Yes, we're hoping to turn up with it and make some noise. Excellent. Thanks very much, guys. Give him a round of applause.